Wells Fargo is America's most hated bank, and I'm going to explain why this is actually a good thing. But first, Wells Fargo wasn't always hated. We were founded in 1852 by Henry Wells and William Fargo to offer banking and express services. It's an exciting story. And the most exciting part is we're still making history today. Wells Fargo used to be cool, like really cool. They started as this gunslinger courier company delivering money and goods across the frontier, basically like the OG Red Dead Redemption. There seems to be an intense desire on the part of Wells Fargo to hold on to its heritage. And for good reason. I mean, it's a compelling pitch. They can basically say, we protected your valuables back when no one else could. Obviously, you can trust us today. We take on a consignment. We promise to deliver it all the way. The bank had its own series, books, and even this weird horse collection, kind of like selling NFTs before it was cool, known as the golden child of banking. Wells Fargo was one of the few surviving banks of the Great Depression. They had the PR, they were known for quality, they regularly hired immigrants and minorities. I was hoping to start over and achieve what I thought to be the American dream, um, which is stability. Uh, something I lacked for most of my life, living in a war zone. But could a bank like Wells Fargo really provide stability? Is there a better alternative? In the early 2000s, there wasn't. Dow Jones Industrial Average now crossing 500 points on the decline. The bull market that ran from 2002 to 2007 has been erased. The market is not functioning properly. There has been a widespread loss of confidence and major sectors of America's financial system are at risk of shutting down. America needed a hero. During the 2008 financial crisis, Wells Fargo stayed true to its reputation as the golden child of American banking. You are why I think you're the best bank in America. Thank you for joining us, John Stump. Meanwhile, a new technology was being developed in frustration with the current system. Oh, we opened, you know, three million accounts. So Stump's looking pretty good. So he gets really big bonuses. Uh, and, and the shareholders are, are loving it. Drum roll, please. There we go. Yeah. All right. And the winner is... John Stump. John uh, Stump of Wells Fargo. Our number one goal when we get up in the morning is not about making money. Our whole business model and reason to get up in the morning and go to work is to serve customers, help them succeed financially. The result is you'll make money. Never put the stagecoach in front of the horses. Stump's a hard guy not to like. I vote him the CEO I would most likely to knock down a fine pilsner with. Wells Fargo seemed to be at the top of the world. Mysteriously, the stock just kept rising in price, far outpacing its competitors. But then Wells Fargo employees began to notice something strange. We used to start early with a morning huddle. The manager would tell you, how many accounts do you commit to opening today? And so um, what they wanted to hear was eight, because that's the, that was their mojo. Eight makes great. Yeah, I'm a numbers person. When I started thinking, wait, this is not possible. St. Helena is a town of 5,000 residents. If there's five bankers, that means we have to open 40 accounts every day. 5,000 divided by 40. The once modest wagon wheel started spinning faster than ever before. Wells Fargo answered to shareholders, and shareholders needed to see growth. One after another, accounts just kept popping up. This whole town needs bank accounts, like you, sir, and you, ma'am, and this skinny gentleman over here. That's a mailbox. By pursuing growth above all else, Wells Fargo had forgotten the most important thing, the customer. They had just violated their very own commandment, putting the stagecoach in front of the horses. Your most important job is not to make money. Our number one goal when we get up in the morning is not about making money. Our whole business model and reason to get up in the morning and go to work is to serve customers. Is to serve customers. Is to serve customers. By demanding unrealistic sales figures and using high pressure to overwork employees, branch managers had to make a choice, their job or their moral code. These were people who in many cases were terrorized. They were afraid that they'd get fired from these $12, $15 an hour jobs and they didn't know where else to go. They thought they were gonna, you know, step into a world of uh, American success and be bankers. And it turned out frequently to be something like, uh, more like a boiler room. Little by little, the truth was unraveling. The critics had to be silenced. It was known that if you made a call to human resources complaining about ethics, that you would get fired. 
Once they terminated you from Wells, you'd never work in banking again. They would block your licenses and you'd never work again. But this couldn't go on forever. Over a million bank accounts opened without customer knowledge. Fake email addresses, phony PIN numbers. They were encouraged to prey on people who spoke little English, college students, and the elderly. New Yorker says two million customers are known to be explicitly defrauded. True or false? That is absolutely false. False selling is all about pumping up Wells stock price, isn't it? No, cross selling is shorthand for a uh, deepening relationship. A million more fake accounts, a total now three and a half million. Wells Fargo said we fired her because she didn't meet her quota. Sir, uh, uh, Senator, I am very sorry that that happened. That was not what we wanted to have happen. As a result, something unprecedented happened. The Federal Reserve imposed harsh sanctions on Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo won't be allowed to get any bigger than it was at the end of last year. Two trillion dollars in assets until the Fed is satisfied that it has cleaned up its act. As for CEO John Stumpf, well, he stepped up and took personal responsibility by firing 5,300 employees. See, Wells Fargo is a company that prides itself in its deeply rooted good old boy persona, but the reality is far from that. Throughout history, mankind has needed to transfer money and goods from one place to another. That's not going to stop anytime soon. But there's an issue. Wherever there's value, security will be a massive challenge. Until recently, we had no option but to trust banks and other third-party institutions. We need them. They keep our money safe. We get a nice little insurance policy, and in return, they get to use our money to invest and fund their operations. And that kind of works. But in many cases, we don't need middlemen like Wells Fargo anymore, thanks to new technology. Anything you would go to a traditional financial institution for, like high yield savings, borrowing, lending, trading, investing, those are all things that can be found in DeFi. Web3 represents kind of a new philosophy about how to realize these technologies in a more distributed and democratic way. With DeFi, you're the bank customer and the bank, profiting on both sides of the transaction. See, with DeFi, the list of ways that you can earn money on your money is nearly limitless. Staking, lending, and arbitrage are just the tip of the spear because it's more than just earning. You really can be your own bank. I mean, let's look at what a bank can do with our money. So imagine that you found $1,000 in an envelope outside. You know, you look over your shoulder, no one's looking at you, you take it. This isn't ethics class, this is banking class. So you go and deposit that money into a bank savings account. That money doesn't just sit there with a sticky note of your name on it. Banks take that and lend it out for profit. You deposit $1,000, the bank will then lend out a portion of that, let's say 90%, $900, keeping 10% in reserves. Because banks are actually creating new money. By lending out your $900 to someone else, the bank now has $1,900 in deposits because of your original original $1,000. But it doesn't stop there. They can keep doing this, looping the money through, eventually increasing their deposits by 10 times. This means when you deposited $1,000, your bank is actually now earning money on $10,000. You're doing them a huge favor by giving them your money. What's even crazier is you can actually do this yourself with DeFi. So let's take the Anchor Protocol. You can deposit a stablecoin pegged to the US dollar and earn it near 20% APY. But there's no central authority in crypto. There's no bank holding your deposit. You are the bank. So after making a deposit, you receive a UST. This is essentially a receipt showing that you made that deposit. However, in DeFi, the receipt is actually what's worth money. It's weird. You make a deposit to earn interest, but then you're still holding the value of that deposit. It's kind of like a cashier's check, but not exactly. And here's where you get to be the bank if you want to. You can actually take that receipt and borrow against it to earn even more money. You deposit $1,000, you get that receipt worth $1,000 that's still earning 20% interest. You borrow 50% against that receipt, paying a small interest rate and getting $500 in cash. You then redeposit that $500 and now your total deposit is $1,500 and still earning interest. It seems like it shouldn't be possible, but that's what banks have been doing all along. But in the wild world of crypto, where the robbers and crooks wear this and not cowboy hats, you have to control your own stagecoach. Unlike any other time in history, we can truly say that money belongs to the people. And I have to thank banks like Wells Fargo for being greedy, because if the system was even somewhat fair, we probably wouldn't even have these DeFi opportunities today. I'd like to thank you so much for watching. I'm Max Maher, and I hope you have a profitable day.